Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started now with the next plenary session. Um, today, we'll be talking about some new types of digital innovation and also developing investment in some new uh, innovations happening across the continent. I'm Sarah Leadham, and I work here in Rwanda with an organization called African Entrepreneur Collective. Locally, people know us as Nhomoko, um, which means the origin of the beginning in Kenya, Rwanda. And we work with young entrepreneurs, helping them grow their businesses. Um, more often, we're seeing young entrepreneurs develop new tech innovations, as Rwanda in particular, as you all know, um, is moving more towards a middle-income country, really with ICT as the core focus. And today, we are joined by an illustrative panel of also people from Rwanda, as well as representatives from across the continent, to be able to talk a little bit about generating investment for new types of technologies. Um, so we've got representatives from the African Union, Ngali Holdings, Rwanda Development Board, and Tigo. And each has their own perspective about how some of these new innovations are facing challenges and tackling new opportunities. Um, so we'll start going down the panel with a few introductions. Every uh, panelist will have about six to eight minutes to introduce themselves and their unique perspective. And then we'll open up to some questions and conversations among the panelists. And also, we'll ask all of you to participate as well with some questions for the panelists. Um, so we're hoping today to, to tackle a range of different issues. And so we'll look forward to the good conversation today. Um, Dr. Ibrahim, let's start with you and uh, representing the African Union. Uh, my name is Ilham Ibrahim. I'm the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy, including, of course, ICT. Uh, I work for the African Union for now up to eight years. This is my second term. Um, I think it is important to, to go directly to the issue. This use of new technologies and, and new applications. So how, from our uh, perspective as African Union Commission, concerned with the continent as a whole, one of the issues is where, from where we have these technologies, from where we have these applications. Is it from outside or is it created in our continent? So this is one. And this needs, of course, what we shall do or what we should do to encourage this creative environment for our generations to, to, to work on that. Uh, secondly, how we encourage and put the environment that uh, encourage and uh, make the investment the, the favorable environment for investment. So this is a second area. The third one, how we can coordinate or put in partnership the investment, science and technology and research, and also the capacities of our people, the rules and policies in the continent. So all these areas that we are working on in the African Union Commission. Beside that, we are also communicating with the world, not to have the, the partnership inside, no. Also, we are open to, to have partnership with others. For example, with Europe, with US, with Asia. I mean, sometimes it is on the country level or on the region level. So this is uh, the, the, the perception or the perspective of the African Union Commission, to have it internally in the continent. On the continent level, we, we have the demand, we have the talented people, what we need to, to, to give them the suitable environment. Because uh, and, um, I can see that I'm here the, the, the most oldest one in the panel, but this is something really makes me happy to, to hear from the, the other panelists who are uh, the creators of, of the future of the continent, what they need from us 
what they need from the African Union to encourage and create the environment that, uh, that give them the opportunity to invest in these new technologies. Yesterday, I had a discussion with the ministers of tourism, and they said, where is the ICT? We need the IT or the ICT to promote our tourism in the continent. And I think this is something very easy. We can use it, even if for promotion or for the processes of receiving and traveling and all these issues. So um, I'm really happy to, to be with you today to, to find something which can push us forward for using the new technology. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Asking just a quick follow-up question before we move to the next, um, to the next presenter. Um, part of what you are talking about right now is creating a positive regulatory environment. Um, today's panel talking about many emerging technologies that are perhaps outside of the existing regulatory framework. Take, for example, uh, bitcoins or cyber currency. Is that something that you're looking at policies in developing? Maybe you have any kind of examples around sort of new policies and procedures that the African Union is looking at as some of these new emerging technologies are existing possibly outside of the existing regulatory frameworks? Uh, thank you for, uh, for the question, but I can tell you, but um, not exactly. We didn't reach the stage yet to go into these uh, details of this. Uh, our uh, first uh, action we took now that to, to put the cybersecurity convention. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also one of the most important issue. And, um, but others are coming. And it, it will come step by step. We have the cybersecurity convention. It was adopted by all the ministers and the heads of the state. It's just a matter of application to encourage all these uh, applications. Right, right. Great. Well, I'm sure as more investment is coming into these areas, more of that regulatory framework will be built out. Great. We'll move now to our next panelist from Ngali Holdings, um, an investor in new emerging technologies. I'm hoping you can introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the kinds of trends that you're seeing and the sorts of new uh, investment opportunities you're seeing across the continent in these new areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I had a group of companies and Angali Holdings, and we've invested indeed in different technologies, uh, one of which has been participating actually a lot in Rwanda. It's called Rwanda Online, which is a government processing platform where government provides services to citizens and businesses. We are also invested in energy and health. In ICT, I also would like to mention that we are invested in cybersecurity. And we, all, we see that there's a lot of opportunity in that area, and we have invested considerably as well in our research and development. So uh, stepping back a bit, uh, Ngari Holdings is five years old. Uh, we began as a systems integration company, providing platforms that link with other platforms, particularly in the area of ICT. So when I say Rwanda Online, it has processing for payment. So it links to all payment technologies. It has applications that we are developing internally, and others from third parties will develop and bring them online. So essentially, as a systems integrator, we exposed all changes in technology. And moving forward, our model is to look at how to use uh, that information that is generated to actually benefit policy in government and improve business in terms of know your client and all that. Uh, furthermore, we've looked at introducing new technologies that can be generated uh, anywhere in the world to optimize current processes that we are undertaking in terms of developing different sectors where we see value. Uh, I'll speak a bit about what we see in terms of energy, uh, more issues related to climate change, drying of long droughts that dry our rivers, how do we integrate other sources with, that, with the current sources that we have, 
what type of technologies will help us. So we are modeling that. So the issue is how do you model a good business around existing technologies and those that are in the offing. Uh, we are looking at uh, as the world generates more data and the cost of storage and the cost of retrieval and sharing, how, how do we provide opportunities around that? So basically, I think I've exhausted my time. We are more focused on inducing technology in processes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I like what you said about building a good business around existing technologies. Do you have, um, do you have an example of one, uh, one business that you really appreciate their business model around an existing technology that you think is really sort of epitomizing a new model that you're trying to invest in? Uh, I can mention application of sensors, for instance, in remote sensing, which is covering a lot of fields from agriculture to health to building maps of information that are easily and graphical for people to use in making decisions about either their logistics, their choices in life, uh, related to where they want to deliver uh, goods or services. If I want to build a restaurant here, how can I tell the population density here? How can I easily find out which similar restaurants are there? Where, where, what demographics am I looking at? That kind of information can be built around platforms that we do have. And there is a lot of data available in the market that you need to organize and process through the platform. So that's an example. Uh, another is big data. So uh, Rwanda has done a great job in terms of organizing and investing in ICT infrastructure. So the next is, as we generate data, how much can we get value out of that? And it's more on how we want to approach a model where our services would support citizens individually or businesses. And I think that is a really good model that is going to help everybody and bring most people who are doing their own applications on board. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next, we'll also have a local government perspective. Um, we have the new director of ICT at Rwanda Development Board, and you also have a presentation that you'd like to make to the whole group today, so welcome. Yes, thank you. I'm called Regis Gataraiha. I head the ICT department uh, of RDB. And part of what we do at RDB is investment promotion, and specifically for the department I head is the ICT sector. I have a small presentation uh, that will share some ideas on how to model attractive investment opportunities in the ICT sector. Thank you. Uh, what you see there is supposed to be the limit, but it's not. <laughs> in the digital world, when you look for investment opportunities, the good news is there are no limits. By building on the optimism and inspiration of getting together for this event, we want to show you where you can begin in your search for opportunities across the African continent. Amongst one billion people, to promote digital transition and help us grow in unconventional ways. We've been able to leapfrog, to leapfrog certain stages and this has reduced structural differences across the world. This then should allow Africa to play in the digital arena. There's an African proverb that has it that if you want to go alone, to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And this is really what Smart Africa is all about. Together, we've created the Smart Africa Alliance to make some of those opportunities in the ICT sector really available and possible for all investors. That shared, uh, set a shared vision of transforming Africa with the power of ICTs, and it embodies commitments to achieve such a vision. As Smart Africa member, 
member states are aligning their ICT master plans to the Smart Africa Manifesto that was adopted here in Kigali during the Transform Africa 2013 summit. It's a clear and focused strategy towards the implementation of an agreement that has been subsequently adopted by the African Union and also endorsed by the International Telecommunication Union. And given the importance of this partnership in transforming the continent, this initiative has gained top leadership commitment and support. Uh, during the Transform Africa 2013 summit, Dr. Hamadun Toure, former ITU Secretary General, uh, delivered his keynote address and uh, he delivered a very powerful message, and I quote, only Africans can develop Africa. Only Africans can make sure that our native continent seizes opportunities of ICTs. Only we can transform Africa, end of quote. This message really resonated strongly with all African countries, and by seizing those opportunities, it created uh, new opportunities for investors. Uh, for example, here in Rwanda, we have started seeing how ICT can have significant impact on different sectors of our economy. Agriculture, education, health, trade and industry, and infrastructure including transport, urbanization, energy and services uh, in different areas, tourism, business process outsourcing, and so forth. So what's the value for investment in ICT? Here in Rwanda, uh, what you're seeing here is really a similar story to other African countries. Uh, for Rwanda, the ICT sector alone contributes to about 3% of the GDP. And by taking advantage of what ICT offers in all of these sectors, Rwanda has been able to attract about 500 million US dollars of investment over the last three years. And as part of this example, uh, in November 2014, Rwanda has been able to launch a fourth generation long-term evolution 4G LTE broadband services with a targeted population coverage of 95% just in three years. So this is an unprecedented rollout of broadband services. This is an, an example of a public-private partnership that has been, uh, that was made possible by a country that took advantage of ICTs for ourselves and created attractive investment opportunities in the sector. I'll now move on to talk about the Smart Cities, which is the flagship focus for Rwanda as part of the Smart Africa Alliance. Uh, Rwanda, Rwanda has pursued to create model smart cities that can re be replicated across the continent implies that uh, gradual establishment of multiple cities as part of community-centric, ICT-enabled lifestyles where citizens can live, work, and play. Basically, we need to sustain a continuous micro and macro hubs growth throughout the nation that creates most, more investment opportunities. We want to create bubbles of ICT-enabled innovative solutions in everything we do everywhere. The idea is to expand the multiple smart cities across the country, which can then translate and perhaps create an added value in viral effect, which may in turn cross regional and continental borders. So how will we do this? We started by give, giving ourselves some key indicators in terms of what it means to be a smart city. 
combined solutions to make this up should be one, community-centric. We need to move forward without being disconnected from our values. We also need to give a chance to homegrown solutions to allow local populations to interpret what technology can do for, the, for them because it's not about what uh, technology can only do for us, but it's also about what we can do for, with, with technology. The combined solutions also have to be affordable, accessible, and available. And I'm happy to be here on the panel with uh, Tongai, who is the Tigo uh, CEO. He'll have a, a, a different, a different uh, uh, representation of this AAA strategy as a telecommunication company, affordable, accessible, and available. But I like it, and I want to use it to use it here before he does. Uh, the solutions also have to be safe and secure, and they need to encourage capacity building uh, for collaboration, jobs, and skill creation, which lead, uh, in turn, to growth and maturity. And then we, we are looking at the paperless economy. We need to move away from paper-based processes to electronic services. A good example is what we are trying to do here in Rwanda through Irembo platform, which is being implemented by Rwanda Online Platform, uh, a spin-off uh, uh, or a subsidiary of uh, Ngali Holdings, um, to consolidate most of government services online. Let's look at some key components of a smart city the way we look at them. Uh, a smart city should have uh, fiber to the home, a combination of fiber to the home, also wireless technologies. Uh, we need to have hub centers, hot spots. We need to have intelligent e-waste management and recycling systems. We need to have green buildings, e-learning for primary and university education, and we also need to have uh, things like intelligent transportation infrastructure for better management of our roads and vehicle traffic monitoring. These are, these are just a few things that you would have in a smart city the way we envisage it. Uh, to clearly see how this relates in terms of the different types of ecosystem structures in generating multiple smart cities, we have basically created uh, three scales. One at Umudugu level, which would include uh, Wi-Fi, wi connectivity, so some businesses, schools, recycling, cybersecurity. And on the second scale, we are looking at a city, a city that would be like a consolidation of uh, a few uh, villages or Umudugudu. Uh, we, we have uh, a project that we are working on to put in place Kigali Innovation City uh, that will cover approximately 61.3 hectares of land which is earmarked close to the special economic zone. And then from that uh, second scale, the third scale is a connected country, connected Rwanda, which would cover entire footprint of the country. Now, with these scales that we are looking at, there are multiple investment opportunities in each of the sections. For example, Rwanda is looking at putting in place a financial support structure in form of Africa Innovation Fund, which allows investment at any level, depending on the needs and investor interests. The fund is to be put in place to support African innovators at various growth stages. And of course, there'll be a set criteria for the innovators to access that fund. Another initiative that is part of the smart city at the second scale, uh, the Kigali Innovation City that I mentioned, uh, a self-sustaining ecosystem of growing knowledge-based industries. Once this is put in place, we hope it will attract global technology brands in a live, work, and play environment that will spur development further and further investment. Alongside Carnegie Mellon University campus, which is already uh, here and 
breaking ground. Let me leave you with a quote from His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, and I quote, we cannot go ahead with everyone else when everyone else is behind, end of quote. Uh, what I read from this is that Africa is not going to remain behind. We believe we can keep a pace through the initiatives coming out of Transform Africa summits. In achieving this, there are huge investment opportunities and benefits making this a reality. And these opportunities are definitely unlimited. So who says the sky is the limit? Definitely not. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. As you're beginning to introduce the Smart Cities concept and the African Innovation Fund to external investors, what's the kind of feedback that you're getting from other investors either throughout the continent or throughout the globe about their take on this as a new innovative investment proposition? Uh, what you are saying is that uh, by creating, uh, by deciding to have things like, a, like, like smart cities, mm -hmm. uh, we are not only looking at uh, having people uh, residing in cities, we are also creating an environment, an enabling environment for innovative solutions to come up. And with that, it also, in a viral effect, it creates more investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So. The model that we are looking at here is really that symbiotic uh, relationship between innovation, entrepreneurship, and creativity that come out of those initiatives. Yeah. Thank you. So the city then becomes a platform for additional innovations to grow on top of it. Yeah, smart. it's not just about having cities, it's about the ecosystem that is self-sustaining for knowledge-based industries. Right. Thank you. Um, and speaking of the sky, we have the rain above us, so hopefully everybody can still hear us as the presentations are happening. But Tangai, I'll now turn it to you, representing Tigo, um, both working in Rwanda, but then also throughout the continent. So hopefully you can share your experiences from Rwanda and any other new innovations you'd like to talk about as well. Sure, thank you, Sarah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. My name is Tongai Maramba. I'm the CEO of Tigo Rwanda. Uh, we want to be the most innovative technology company in Rwanda, and I think we're well on our way to getting there. Um, I just wanted to start by uh, sharing something which really uh, touched me when I, when I saw it, and I've shared it before on Twitter. Um, often we talk as we sit today and we talk about how advanced we are in terms of technology, uh, where we, you know, what we can do with our devices, with our software, with the applications, uh, and all the wonderful things that are happening uh, in the digital space. But uh, the truth is that uh, I think it's a human condition that we always believe that the time right now is the most advanced thing that you could ever see. So I have a quick video that I want to show you. I don't know if the team can put that up. For this, the Information Technology Year, BBC Two begins a new series now that explores the world of information science in the computer program. You may have noticed, 1982 is Information Technology Year. There's a Minister of Information Technology, and the government's even spending a great deal of money on publicizing it. But what is information technology? All it really means is the world of computers. But why have they suddenly become so important, and what should we as non-computer experts know about them? Well, that's exactly what I shall be finding out during this series. One thing I know already, don't expect the computer revolution to happen tomorrow. It's happening last part of that he says the computer revolution is happening now and that was in 1982 so this is the BBC this is a, a journalist who's trying to tell the story to consumers that uh, IT is this new amazing thing we even have a minister of information technology and uh, this is going to be something that's going to change the world um, and that was almost 30 years ago so it just gives some context into when we talk now about where we are and what we've achieved uh, we think 30 years forward, what more can we look forward to and what more can we achieve? So I thought that was an interesting thing to, um, to take a look at. Um, and, and related to that, I think, is, uh, is the question of where do we go with technology in Africa? What are the digital opportunities? We've talked a lot about um, where we can make investments and what those could look like. 
Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that has uh, really struck me as I've been working here in Rwanda is that um, you really find that the digital space is very rich with business models, with solutions, with services, with products. You have this.com, that.net. Uh, but, you know, the truth of the matter is that a lot of that um, digital innovation, a lot of those ideas are coming out of places outside of Africa. They're coming out of San Francisco, and they're coming out of London, and they're coming out of Frankfurt. And so, really, you have a situation where uh, something that could work really well in inner San Francisco makes a lot of sense for people that live there, can't translate into where we are, into, into our context here in Africa. And I think that's a very important thing for us to, to really internalize uh, and to make the most of. Um, there's this... Uh, there's this hashtag on Twitter, which is a bit of a joke. Um, it's hashtag first world problems. And it, it says things like, you know, you go to Starbucks and they don't have soy milk for your skinny latte. What do you do? Hashtag first world problems. And I think, you know, what, what, um, what we need to do is we need to recognize that a lot of the digital solutions that we find out there are addressing hashtag first world problems. If you take a, a product like Uber, which is uh, a great product, which, which I've used a lot when I've traveled in Europe and the US. Um, a fantastic product, but it's not really a, a, a solution for problems that we have in Kigali, for example. Um, and what we need to do, and I think this is where uh, innovation and disruption comes, is we need to start to think about, well, what are the genuine consumer challenges that people have in our market? What are the specific needs that we need to solve? And how is technology going to help that? And, you know, and that's something that at Tigo we, we, we spend a lot of time trying to understand because you know, we're relating to people who are being introduced to the internet for the very first time, never mind uh, you know, heavy digital users. And so when we bring something to our consumers, we need to bring it with a very strong and very clear value proposition. We can't just say, well, this is the latest digital app, therefore you have to use it and you have to pay, pay us for it. You know, we need to bring a strong case that addresses a particular need that people have. And we've seen um, that consumers are very happy once they understand the need to use the service, they'll, they'll make sure they learn it, however uh, sophisticated it may be. They'll learn how to use it, and they'll make the most of it. And I think a great example of that is mobile payments. Um, it's a business which has grown tremendously fast uh, here in Rwanda, in, in East Africa in particular. Um, but really, if you would have gone back five years and tried to explain to someone, well, your money is not going to be in your hand. It's going to be on a phone. And if you want to send it to someone else, you just need their phone number. I mean, that's a real leap of faith for a lot of people, and, and yet we've managed to get there because people recognize that this is a digital solution to a specific problem that they have, um, and it addresses that problem. So, so they're really bought into it. I think another great example, uh, going back to the example of Uber, is there's a great little startup that's, uh, that's, uh, that's here in Rwanda, which is called Safe Moto. And what they've done is they've said, what is a hashtag Kigali problem? And the problem is, uh, you want to take a motor taxi and you have many of them approaching you. You don't know which one has a safe driver. You don't know which one has a driver who has a driving license. You don't know, you know how much experience each of the drivers have. And so they've developed an application which tracks uh, the movements of the bike, the acceleration, the deceleration, changes in direction. And then they put all of that information into an algorithm and they push it onto your phone. So you can see, well, this is a safe driver. This is not a safe driver. Um, very simple problem. Which is, which is felt by people who use motor taxis in, in Kigali, very, very relevant to here. Um, and you know, the, the idea and the solution is developed here, and I believe that's the kind of business that can be um, uh, very successful if it gets to scale. So you know, key for me is that we start to think really very much about how we can um, understand the specific challenges of consumers in Africa, and how we can start to use technology to address those specific challenges. Um, and, you know, as, as I said, at Tigo, we're very focused on, on trying to address that. We see opportunities in professional development, how people learn and develop, how people um, get jobs, how people develop their careers. We see opportunities in media and entertainment, so, um, you know, in music, in, uh, in sports, in TV. There's a lot of opportunity to really develop um, uh, the content and get people uh, able to uh, enjoy the benefits of digital, but also see it as something that's addressing specific needs that they have. So um, I think that's about all I have to share, but thank you very much for, uh, for having me on the panel, Sarah. Thanks, Tangay. Um, let's talk to me a little bit more about um, technologies that transfer and technologies that don't. So one of, the, one of the suppositions about why people are interested in investing in African tech is because it's often leapfrogging 
um, the slow pace of maybe one iteration after the next iteration after the next iteration that you see in some other developed markets. Um, are you seeing that in, in the areas where a tech transfer isn't an automatic one for one, are you seeing African innovations that are um, fulfilling that promise of leapfrogging within developing markets? Yes, I would say so. I would say it's, it's true right now um, more as an exception than as a rule. Um, and I would really go back to mobile payments as the biggest example that we have. You know, this is something which is, is a leapfrog. This is something which originated out of Africa, uh, addressing an African need, but is now spreading across the world. Um, uh, we still have one third of all the mobile payments wallets in the world are in East Africa. But, you know, there's now two thirds uh, in the rest of the world. So it, it is something that's starting here and spreading across, um, across the world. Um, and, you know, you'll, you'll travel to more advanced markets and you will see, and I have seen it for myself, um, you know, billboards and adverts where uh, financial institutions are trying to say to their consumers, now you can transfer money by phone. And it's like we've been doing that in Africa for years. I mean, what's, what's going on? So I think the transfers can actually, um, you know, go in, in, in both directions. Um, coming the other way, I think we, we were talking as we were coming in about um, sort of the innovations that are really at the edge, at the leading edge of, of technology. And, and um, we uh, got an opportunity to interact with a team that's setting up, uh, that's starting up in, again, in San Francisco, um, and are trying to develop an augmented reality product. product. So we've all heard of Google Glass um, and, um, and, and its story and, and the benefits that it was trying to bring. And this was a, a team that was developing um, a, a contact lens, which could essentially do the same thing. And in that conversation, as we were talking to them, they were saying things like, well, you know, we'd be interested to come to Africa, but we don't know what the use cases might be for our, for our products. We don't know, um, you know, whether or not we could offer this as a consumer product. Um, we don't know what the ecosystem is like for us to be able to produce the hardware. You know, do you have the, 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 you know, the, the technology to do this, to, to produce the contact lenses, to produce the, 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 the semiconductor technology that's needed for this? Um, and in a lot of those cases, we had to say, no, it's not, it's not really there yet. Um, but, you know, sometimes you need to bring the technology into the market so that you can, um, you can give it to the consumers and help them show you where it can address a need. And, um, and I think that's, that's probably going to be part of the process, is, is using, um, using consumers themselves to take a tool, um, model it, mold it to, to, you know, to their specific circumstance, um, and then create some value out of it, which you, you can then capitalize on. Great. Great. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your presentations. Um, we'll do a couple more questions uh, to the whole group, and then hopefully open that up to the rest of the audience as well so that you can have your questions answered. Um, so one of the things that Steve Jobs has been credited for is actually not just the creation of the iPhone, but the creation of a whole industry surrounding this new platform. Um, I think now the statistics are that the, um, the applications uh, for iPhones and smartphones are actually double the actual sales of the actual product itself. So as we're looking at new emerging technologies, drones, uh, cyber currency, artificial intelligence, um, do you see the potential um, for a sort of similar peristitial or sort of um, ancillary whole movement of applications on some of these new types of technologies that are pushing the envelope. Would anybody like to answer that? Andrew? Please. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just to start, and I think the start can come from uh, the comment of, of uh, my colleague here who mentioned homegrown applications. I, I think, yes, we are open for other of applications, the international one, or what is created anywhere. But we need really our homegrown uh, applications. Because it uh, replies to the needs, to our real needs. So I, I think this is one of the main points that we, we have to, to stress and to, to use. Thank you. I, I think there's nothing wrong uh, in adopting new technologies that are emerging for as long as they really respond to the real problems that we have in our context. So things like drones, uh, maybe uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Mr. Tongai 
uh, as the head of uh, a telecommunication company uh, that provides most of these services. Uh, are you looking at these uh, new technologies like drones, like balloons that provide uh, telecommunication services and internet, are you looking at them as uh, an opportunity uh, that the company should look into uh, to solve some of the problems that we still have for connectivity, for example, where fiber optic does not get or are you looking at it as a competition? Because that's where we need to, to find a meeting point. Mm -hmm. uh, so l let, me, um, let me address the question directly. Um, I think when it comes to the internet, we really see it in, in, in two parts. Uh, the first part is, is access, and the second part is content. Um, a lot of what I was talking about is around the content. So you know, what can you do on the internet, and what, can you, what services can you benefit from? But you know, talking about balloons and talking about drones and telecom, typically we find ourselves talking about the access part of the business, the, the infrastructure part of the business. And I think you know, what's happening in the industry and uh, you know, the, the, the 4G um, uh, launch and the structure around 4G is a great example of that, is that very much uh, we are starting to move away from uh, being an infrastructure player to being a services player, and more importantly, an internet services player. So that's why I said at the beginning, we aspire to be the most innovative technology company in the country, not the most innovative telecom. Uh, because I think it's not just about an infrastructure game anymore. So if there's balloons that can work, that can give access at lower cost, whether we invest or someone else invests, we'll be happy to, to, to take advantage of, of that technology. If there is infrastructure which is being deployed by a third party that we can use to give access to our customers, we'll be happy to take advantage of that because you know, at the end of the day, infrastructure will take us so far in terms of the value of the business, but you know, beyond that, what you really do with your consumer relationship is you start to offer products and services, and this is the digital story. So um, you know, we'd be very excited to see that the cost of building a network comes down and the ubiquity of coverage uh, increases at lower cost. That's, that's great news for us. I wanted to talk a little bit more also about the notion of homegrown solutions. Um, a lot of that also has to do with education in the ICT space. Um, Rwanda is starting to significantly improve and invest in education with ICT. Um, Carnegie Mellon is also now sort of launching an incubator and sort of continuing to work with people on growing ICT um, uh, skills and resources. ICT and education, looking at that both through the investment lens, um, often you see really well-funded universities have research scholarships, fellowships, all of that sort of investment coming into universities to be able to spur new innovations. How are you seeing that in an African context? Are we seeing enough innovation investment in African universities to be able to be competitive on a global scale? Uh, I think that's what we are trying to achieve uh, through initiatives such as uh, the one that we, we have here in Rwanda with the partnership between the government of Rwanda and the Carnegie Mellon University mm -hmm. to have it domiciled here in Rwanda and train the people locally, basically giving uh, our, our uh, students uh, the knowledge that is very high, uh, uh, high class but in the context of Rwanda because they need to, 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 to come up with solutions that are applicable in the context of Rwanda. And I think this is uh, something that can be adopted in uh, all African countries for us to be able to give a chance to homegrown solutions. We are not saying that uh, we should not uh, adopt technologies that are invented uh, outside the, the, our countries, out, outside the African continent, but uh, investment in research and development in universities should also be aligned with the problems that are, that makes, that are relevant to our environment. Right. Thank you. Sarah, I would, I would also add that I think success breeds success. So, um, you know, you'll find um, in places where it's, you know, you've had very successful growth in, in technology and technology innovation that, uh, you know, companies will start to move into an area because they just know there's a lot of talent in specific areas in, in that particular place. And I think you know, that's something which has begun in Rwanda and just needs to get, to, to get built on. We, we, we have a growing ecosystem around that. And I think, um, there, I think there's certainly work to do. I think we had a very frank exchange with the Minister of ICT on a, on a panel 
uh, recently when we were talking about the same topic, how do we develop uh, ICT and technology. And you know, one of the areas we recognize as, as being an area of opportunity is, is how to start to really accelerate the, um, the skilled people coming out of the tertiary education system who can come into this um, innovation ecosystem. And you know, it's as much on, on government as it is on, on the private sector to participate in that. We need to support uh, the university with programs to actually encourage students to, to drive innovation and give them access to, um, to our businesses so they can come in and learn, and, and, and a lot of us are starting to do that. Uh, but certainly I think, you know, if we think in terms of ecosystem, and again, going back to your comments about Steve Jobs, that's, that's really the key. I think, I think we do have the opportunity to build a billion dollar internet business in Africa, but it needs to be, it needs to come out of that, that sort of an ecosystem. So this is maybe a question directly for people who are doing direct investing and sort of thinking about billion dollar tech businesses. Um, so when you look at the, um, the profile of most of the companies that are seeking investment in ICT. Let, let's take, for example, um, companies that are on VC for Africa. So VC for Africa is an online platform, lots of tech investment, much social innovation, um, and has invested roughly $30 million at this point into different um, innovations around tech. Most of the ICT platforms that are listed on uh, VC for Africa are seeking well below a million dollars to sort of launch their company or go into that next growth stage. Um, a lot of the investment that we're seeing is sort of bifurcated between small startups that are seeking investment to be able to launch a, a new app or new product or sort of major large infrastructure projects which are, you know, uh, AU style projects. Um, so where do you see, uh, in terms of investment, where do you see investors filling that middle gap? Um, if we're gonna be growing these companies that will be able to be a billion dollar company, are they coming from those, the small entrepreneurs who are then able to continue to grow that business or are these different types of players that are seeking different types of large investments? Well, uh, Don't all talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say something about that because I've noticed that uh, like any place that begins to grow, you usually have challenges on what makes a company successful. So in a value chain of any business, when you're building any business model, you want to see the full ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And most of what we have is a limit in the ICT sector particularly in Africa, is an incomplete ecosystem. So any development of an application will need somebody to host it. We need basically, look at your ecosystem and it brings a huge cost to the small company. So to advance that, uh, there are two ways to look at it. Either have an intermediary who is going to be the integrator who has more resources, and allow that, like an iPhone would have applications on it, but to build an iPhone would be expensive. So basically, we're looking at different business models that are enabling within the ecosystem. And we cannot ignore that, because at the end of the day, attrition rate increases with lack of, or a huge risk within the ecosystem. As a company, we've been focusing on systems integration, and lack of up people building applications would actually constrain our resources. Mm -hmm. We would have to do it ourselves. So basically, there is an interdependency within an ecosystem that is so important for us to build. And it comes from two areas. One is policy. If government is properly focused, they provide the right environment for that to work. So basically, you would have a PP model that supports other small businesses that would benefit from that. So that is on one side. On the other side, we also need to appreciate what has happened over time in technology. So I would like to encourage people to look at solutions and drive from the existing technologies an integration model that would make it quickly available for people to deploy. Mm -hmm. The challenge of long term, or the time it takes for a, a startup to incubate through the process of stability and maturity is too long for their sustainers. And if the ecosystem is weak, then it makes it difficult for them to evolve. So the African continent needs to look at itself in two dimensions. One, it's multiple languages, multiple groups of people in different 
sovereign nations. And ICT can help to move that quickly, but policy limits expansion of the market. So I think I, uh, these efforts to integrate markets is important. Uh, and it's going to be the base of how to build a billion dollar company from a startup. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to do it within the current configuration. Thank you. So we have about 15 more minutes. Um, are there questions from the audience that people would like to ask our panelists? Got one down here. Is there somebody with a traveling microphone who can come for the question? Or maybe you can just speak loudly and I can reiterate it to the group. Here you go. Microphone after all. Is that on? That sounds like yeah. it is. Um, just like to hear some more comments about the overall appetite of international investors for startups. I mean, I think everyone's very interested in that kind of thing and maybe some stories or some just general comments about what they're looking to see when they get these startup pitches or perhaps Series B pitches and those kinds of things. Great. Were you able to hear that? Some questions yeah. about just the general appetite for investment, particularly, I think, notable Series B. I mean, um, what we're seeing um, a fair bit is uh, what's the what's the appetite for follow-on funding? Is a, is a new innovation required to be to have positive cash flow um, to prove its worth in the model, or just sort of any general comments that you can make about appetite for investment in African tech? I think um, it's still early days, and it, it goes back to your question about um, you know where where are we going to find the startups that can graduate through the different grades of, of, of a business and, and become, uh, being, become large businesses. I, th I think today the reality is that we have a bit of a, we have a problem on both sides potentially. Uh, on the one hand, there are certainly investors who are looking to invest money, whether it be impact investing, you know, um, social um, contributions or full, on, full commercial investments who are unable to find the opportunities. Uh, and then on the other hand, of course, there's a lot of people who have great ideas, great entrepreneurs, who are unable to find uh, the money, the investment money. Um, so I think that, you know, the picture's a bit mixed, and it's only going to clear up as the sector matures. As we find, uh, as we start to improve a lot of the basics, a lot of the things we're talking about, that we have, you know, good, trained people in the sector who are now involved in, in growing these businesses, we have enough of them sprouting and, and some of them graduating, we'll start to see that, um, you know, that ecosystem develops in, in the sense that, you know, the information between investors and uh, businesses will start to develop and mature. And I think that's when we'll start to see a lot more interest because I believe speaking as, as, as a company that has made significant investments in this country and in, in other countries in Africa, you know, we do see tremendous potential and we invest in startups ourselves in the sense that there are businesses which we build from the ground up as part of Tigo in all of our countries. And you know, those, business, those investments will continue to happen with our business and um, in other countries. And the reason for that is the underlying opportunity is there. Um, what you need to do is you need to crack the consumer proposition um, and, and from there you, you can grow. So our, our advantage, I guess, is that we're here in the market. We know it very well. Um, so we're comfortable to make investments when we're building our businesses. And for those investors that are outside, I think we still need to start to mature the platforms that enable um, them to access the information on, on what's going on on the ground here. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. Great. All right, there's another question down here in the front row, and forgive me if I'm only seeing people in the front, so if you've got a question in the back, get your hand up high, but down here in the front. Thank you very much. Um, since this morning I've been uh, in this room, listening to tremendous advances in terms of ICTs, um, just young guys showing their solutions, uh, and often I've been, I've been wondering whether really uh, these solutions address real priorities for our communities. To me, it seems that uh, Actually, the most challenging issues that are being addressed by the, by, by the solutions 
uh, are just for a limited, sophisticated market of people who are just tech savvy. Excuse me, maybe I'm, I'm being a bit uh, extremist. Uh, I just want somebody here on the panel, somebody raised an issue about responding to the real problems of our communities beyond the sophisticated market to me that is addressed today. If I take the example of someone who said about the gears of the, of the car, about the, uh, how to control, I don't know, uh, uh, the, 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 the speed, the things like that, is it actually the most striking issue our communities are facing? Is uh, the ICT sector going to address uh, just issues uh, that, uh, that uh, at the end of the day will not come up with the um, uh, uh, solutions addressing for, 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 the, for the wide community in which we are living today. Uh, this is why I would like the panel to elaborate a little bit on how these solutions that are uh, developed and, uh, and uh, sold by some of the, pro uh, uh, by the providers how, how do they really respond to the, to the real problems? Okay. This meaning that Thanks. probably let's, the communities should be involved in the selection of these, uh, 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 of these uh, solutions. Just uh, a, a quick one, the last one. Um, I saw a predominance uh, of youth in this sector. And I've been wondering, where are the BBC guys? We people know so many of the hardships, of the problems. And we should be part of the solution. I really, uh, so let's let the panelists have a chance to respond yes, to that. Thank you for your question. All right, thank you. So uh, summarizing, are these uh, solutions in search of a problem? If I could, if I could um, uh, have a go at that, I think, I, I think it's a very relevant question to ask, which is uh, let's make sure that we're actually tackling problems that people have. Let's not just come up with something that's trendy for the sake of it. Uh, in fact, the reality is that, um, and this is our experience in Rwanda as Tigo, is that uh, the consumer will not reward you for giving him something cool that doesn't solve a problem. Like when you solve a problem, that's when they will reward you and they will, they will show you that you're giving them value. So I think it's, it's, it's a very important principle to have in, in this. However, having said that, it's not the same to say that um, a, a product is sophisticated and therefore is not accessible. To, to people, for example, in a rural community because you can have a very sophisticated product um, which is designed in such a way that it can be accessible. And I think a good example of that, if we talk about the Internet of Things, we talk about machines talking to each other over the Internet, that sounds incredibly advanced. But when you say, let's use the Internet of Things to put sensors on drones that fly over a field and can tell you whether or not there's, uh, your, your beans are healthy or there's a, there's a disease which is spreading or it's time to harvest, and then that message can be sent as an SMS to the farmer. That's the Internet of Things. That's very advanced, but it's delivered in a way that you know, the user can understand and can access. And so I think, again, the principle is, is very solid and very sound that we need to make sure that we're addressing a consumer need and making it accessible. Great. I think we're getting to the, the last little bit of our panel. I'm, I'm unfortunately have lost track of time. So maybe everybody can offer one sort of parting comment if you want to build off that last piece or share some, some final insight. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I will be very uh, short. The market will respond. That's how business works. And the African market is not the one that doesn't respond. It will. Uh, what we're simply saying is advances in technology as they are today and where they're leading, we strongly believe that analytics is going to inform policy and we're going to have better policies and more information is going to be available to direct resources properly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I may also build on, uh, on that to respond to our local needs. It, it will not come suddenly. We should start from the beginning, also building our capacities, our people who can respond to our actual needs, if we, even if it is very sophisticated or very simple. So I think this is one of the issues that we should take care of and give the opportunity to our kids from the beginning to think, starting from the way of education the, the methods, how we, 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 we teach them in the schools, how we develop their 
intelligence and talent, so they will be able to respond to our needs. Thank you. Mr. Director, the last word. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to come back to uh, the question from the Honorable uh, Wellars about the sophistication of innovations that we are seeing today. Uh, I think this is exact, it's a valid question, and this is exactly what uh, the heads of states uh, who are here at the Transform Africa Summit 2013 realize that we need to focus on a few things that make sense for Africa. And that's how the flagship projects uh, were crafted. So we are basically starting to see how uh, the governments are aligning their, and I talked about it in my presentation, governments are now aligning their ICT master plans uh, to that manifesto of the, transform, of the Smart Africa uh, uh, manifesto. And it's, I would say it's, uh, we are trying to organize creativity because uh, innovations can be good, but when they, are, when they are not organized, if you leave the young people to simply think about uh, new things, they'll do uh, wonders, but uh, you find that some of the solutions don't really make sense for, 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 for our context. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to all the panelists, and thank you to the questions from the audience. Um, this is the end now of our panel, and I'm sure we could really talk much longer on, uh, on each one of these different types of innovations and how new financing models are appearing for all of them. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find the panelists later on in the session. Um, for now, just a quick moment of housekeeping before we all leave the room. Um, hopefully everybody is getting ready for lunch. We have uh, coming up after this plenary, we've got two lunch options. If you've been invited to a sponsored lunch, there is the Airtel sponsored lunch focused on smartphone networks. That's by invitation only. Um, other guests are welcome to join us in the food court for a variety of different options for lunch. And that runs from now uh, for the next hour until 2.30. Immediately following that, we'll be breaking into different breakout sessions again. So from uh, 2.30 until 4 p.m., and we'll have the new black gold on harnessing Africa data revolution. And that's in the Akagera room. Um, there'll be a session on cyber resilience, and that will be in the Serena Auditorium. And finally, we'll continue the conversation about Africa's smart cities, cities of the future, which will be in the Serena Ballroom. Um, so hopefully you'll all enjoy a lovely lunch and continue having this conversation with each other and then enjoying the sessions later today. So thank you so much. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you.